Hey everybody, what's up? It's David Aryev here again for another excellent iDesign.com Octane tutorial. And today we're going to be dealing with characters. And by characters, I mean like Detective Pikachu style, like adding tons of hair to them and trying to get them to this really photorealistic quality. And so we're going to be downloading a character from Turbo Squid or CG Trader, wherever you want. We'll be posing them, we'll be lighting and rendering and dealing with adding selection tags for the hair and we'll even be doing a bit of sub D modeling which is a rarity for me because I totally suck at modeling but I'm starting to get there just starting and I really hope you'll enjoy this and pick up some tips so let's do this thing okay so I'm gonna show you this fun project that I've been working on with my wife Chelsea it all started one day when she did this cute little drawing on the iPad that she named Bumble Mouse and because she started learning C4D and she's been enjoying collaborating with me on projects she wanted help converting this cute little guy into a render so after about an eight-hour session of us banging our head against the wall and me struggling with C4D's hair system and getting all of this looking good this is what we arrived at and this also happened to be a fun render we made for Beeple because it was his birthday, June 20th, and she was starting her everydays that day because he started his everydays on May 1st, her birthday, back in the day. So you might recognize the cheese from one of EJ's tutorials that Chelsea followed along with and modeled using volume modeling, and we applied a nice subsurface scattering material that I'll break down for you guys, as well as doing some volume modeling with this honey and modeling little elements like this quarter round. Honestly, I'm not very good at modeling, but you can definitely do easy stuff like this. And here, this was our first attempt at posing this character and making this cute little bee mouse, getting the wings on there, and really trying to get a ton of super small hairs on this character, just like a real creature would have, and figuring out how to add stripes. Now, this was not a perfect first attempt. You can see the arm is a little bit patchy, so that's not looking that great. The eyes kind of have this raccoon effect because we cut some of the hair out here, as well as the nose. So it's a good first try, but it's not perfect. And we went on to improve this little bumble mouse. So here we put him in another scene that Chelsea modeled by following along with EJ's School of Motion course and just octanifying everything, adding in all those digital nature techniques that I've taught you before. And it's pretty amazing that this scene is almost fully composed of primitives. It goes to show how far good lighting and texturing can push an image. And here's a bit more of a long lens, shallow depth of field shot. And as she continued following along with EJ's course, she got to the part with a tape cassette, she modeled that, and then we textured it and made it bumble mousy by making it this honeycomb pattern, subsurface scattering, waxy look. Next, we went back and tweaked the hair settings even more, and this is what we're calling Bumble Mouse 2.0 because the hair settings are looking a lot better. There's some fine clumping going on, there's less kind of curl and frizz, and we removed the stripes from his face because it was a little bit awkward, so this is feeling like a more high quality and fully realized character. And this is totally a happy accident, but this is so great because what's happening here is the subsurface of the skin is showing through and you're seeing the hairs on the back side causing shadows through the skin. And so we basically get this for free because we've got subsurface scattering materials as well as hair materials that are interacting like they would in the real world and creating this physically accurate result. Next we gave him some golden honeycomb headphones and posed him like a rocker and finally gave him some whiskers. We also worked with brushing a lot of these hairs to get this kind of unkempt look like he's been scruffed up a little bit. And there's our in-your-face rocker. And finally, we wanted to create a scene that incorporated Bumble Mouse's girlfriend, Bumbleina. So we did an image search of mice dancing. And posing is really hard without reference, especially for us, because we're not character animators. We don't exactly know what we're doing. So we kind of copied the pose from this illustration that I'll show you in a second here. The other things I want to point out are just the nice volumetric lights that are contributing to the scene and casting these really cool rays down onto our characters because they're actual physically accurate lights that are shining through this grid and creating these light rays. And here's a bit of a tighter shot. And you can see there are a lot of hairs on these guys, but that's why they look so cute and cuddly. So I've collected some reference here, and if you don't already know, this app is called Pure Ref. And you can see this is the pose that we used for those dancing mice. But I'm thinking for today we could do something cute like this, having our little bumble mouse dude holding on to a fork with some cheese on it, maybe put some honey dripping down, because that's the signature mouse plus bee honey kind of thing. We could also have him climbing up some kind of pole or something like this, or maybe look at one of these poses. But one thing to keep in mind is our character looks more like a mouse than this character that's a little bit more anthropomorphic with these longer legs. Our guy has more stumpy mouse-like legs like this. 
So poses like this are gonna fit a lot better. So if you're interested and for some reason you really wanna follow along to a T, this is the mouse that we purchased. But keep in mind that the techniques I'm about to show you are going to work with any character you purchase off of any stock site. So don't think too hard about it. You can do the same thing with any kind of fuzzy creature. Just pick whichever you want. Now, this guy is rigged, and unfortunately it was created in Maya, so all the controls for the rig are not going to translate, but this is a really common issue that I'll show you how to get around. And also, none of the hair is going to come across, so we have to rebuild all the hair natively in Cinema 4D and Octane. There are a couple things about this mouse render that I like even more than what we did with Bumble Mouse. Maybe some things we could try and improve with Bumble Mouse. I really like how some of these hairs get super long up here on the ear and kind of tuft out. Same thing with on the top of the head. But with the body, you can see it's all pretty short in length. And there's a lot of hairs going on here to make it look soft and cuddly. And also here, the hairs kind of taper down in length until it gets to look like stubble. I'm not sure how much I love this look here, but it's kind of interesting and a different technique. We're not gonna go with this exact look, but it's kind of cool to see the differences. All right, so I've got my downloaded mouse character here, and I'm just gonna take the FBX and drag it directly into C4D. And this is what I'm getting when I first bring this dude in, and you may have more or less functionality than I do if you've downloaded a native C4D rig, then obviously that's gonna be more compatible, but there are tons of rigs out there that come from Maya or 3ds Max, so let's take a look at how we can kind of clean this up. So normally these splines would be handy dandy controllers that would allow you to actually adjust different aspects of your character. In my case, that's not true at all, they're completely disconnected. So instead of going about re-rigging this whole thing and re-adding the controls, I feel like that's just an unnecessary step when I'm just gonna end up deleting the rig anyway once I get my pose down. So let's come down here to this animation group, and these are all these spline controls, and I'm literally just gonna delete all of them. And also, just a quick note, make sure that your joint filter is on. A lot of the time I have it off, so just make sure to toggle and turn that on. Now, if I want to adjust one of these controls, I could come down here and twirl all these down and say I want to get to the arm. Let's go spine, come down here, and finally we get to something like the clavicle and we can adjust it and see our character update and all that binding is still good, all the weighting is still good, but there's a much easier way to get to individual joints. So what we can do is we can come to this geo here and find our actual body, so that's this one here. Now let's turn off all these subdivision surfaces here because that's gonna speed us up a lot. And here with this mouse geo, what we can do is we can come to layers and just double click to create a new layer. And I'll just drag this while holding down control so that we get everything below it. If I hadn't done that, I would just get the one item in the layer. But if I hold down control, I'll get everything below. And now let's lock this. So now when I click, I'm clicking through the geometry to the bones and that makes it a lot easier to select these things and adjust them. Now these yellow joints here, if we use scroll to first active, I set this to Alt S. So I can just click here and hit Alt S and it'll take me to these. These are tail controls. They look like they're not actually doing anything, so I'm just gonna delete these. Though we do have access to different joints on this tail. And last but not least, I feel like these eye bones are just kind of creepy and unnecessary. And when I start moving these around, you'll see that there are additional overlapping joint chains. I don't know if you're going to have that same issue. I think some are designed for IK originally and some were designed for FK. So I'm just going to make sure that I don't have any duplicates by kind of moving these around and making sure that everything is good to go. So here's another one. Let's undo. So you can see here we've got these different FK and IK chains that are just extras at the moment since we're not really doing animation and it doesn't really matter. All right, so next I'm gonna unlock this layer so that we can access the geometry again because there's something I wanna show you. So let's just do a test and add hair really quickly. So if we go over to simulate hair objects, add hair, it doesn't work, it's grayed out when we've got the subdivision surface activated. Same thing's true if the subdivision is on. So that doesn't really work, but what we can do is we can come down to this underlying geo and go to simulate hair objects, add hair. Okay, and now the hair is obviously way too long, so let's come in and take our length down to something like 0.1. Okay, there we go, and it's also growing very uniformly. So what we can do is we can change the root to polygon area, and then we can hit regrow, and then it distributes much more evenly. Now this is bugging me real quick, but I'm gonna hit Shift V and take down the tinted border to 0% so that we're not seeing that. Now if we wanna see these hairs without rendering them, what we can do is we can come to our editor here, and instead of display guidelines, we can come down to hairlines. 
and we're not really seeing much of anything because our hairs are currently only at 5,000. So let's just jump this up to 50,000. And now we're seeing some actual hairlines. Now in our editor, we can take this detail all the way up to 100. And now we're seeing this a lot better. Now with our hairs, we're still gonna probably want a lot more of these. So let's just increase this to 500,000. There we go. Now we can see what's going on. Now this is gonna start chugging pretty badly. But if I come in here, it should be obvious that there's an issue. Now these hairs are conforming to the shape of the polygons before the subdivision surface. And if I turn on the subdivision surface, it still doesn't do any better. We've now got smooth geometry, but we don't have smooth hairs that reflect growth on the subdivision surface. Under the guides here, we've got a link, so we could try linking to the subdivision surface, but that doesn't work either. Okay, and this is why I thought I eventually needed to bake down the subdivision surface and the rig was to fix this issue with the ears. Also, I wanted to scale up the ears and I literally just figured out how to do all that without baking down the mesh. So that should keep things a lot more open and flexible. And I probably should have realized this before, but the answer to all things in Cinema 4D, really all things in the universe, when it's broken, use a connect object. So now with the connect object, we can go into our hair object and go to our guides and link it to the connect object. And then we just have to hit regrow. And we've also got another slight issue with the polygons, obviously. So if we just come here and untick weld, things will go back to normal. Now, if we turn the hair back on and let's regrow again, there we go. That's what it should look like. And the ear seems a little bit weird, but just to prove it to ourselves that nothing's actually going wrong, what we can do is we can get rid of the connect object. And before we bake it down, we'll actually have to delete out the pose morph tag. And now we can hit C. And now we've just got a dense polygon mesh. And if we connect the hair back to the geometry here and regrow it, we should see that our result is identical. All right, I'm gonna delete this hair for now. And the first thing we're gonna do is try and match that pose that we had earlier. All right, so first off, let's get that image in here that we want to use as reference for the pose. I'll just drop in a plane and scale it down. I'll flip it upwards 90 degrees and then scoot it back and scale it down further. And let's just bring it behind him a little bit like that. All right, let's just create a new C4D material by double clicking, drop this on our plane, and then let's turn off these other channels and just use the luminance channel. And then let's bring in our image, this cheese pose here. There we go, I think that works. Let's turn off the subdivision surface here and let's put down a floor so that we can actually make sure that his feet are touching the floor. And then let's bring this up a little bit. All right, so to make this a little bit easier to see when we're adjusting these joints, we can middle click this hip joint, which will just select all the children of the hierarchy. And then we can change this display color to something like a bright red. There we go, that makes it a lot easier to select. Now let's just grab one of these guys here and begin rotating it up. And it looks like we've missed a couple of these joint chains to delete, so let's just do that. And same thing with this guy. And then we'll just drag this guy up a little bit. And then with this back foot, we can drag this backwards and then maybe come down to this bone here and bend it upwards. And maybe drag this even further downwards and drag this a little upwards. So it kind of looks like his foot is squishing on the floor there. And we can take his entire group here and bring it down a little bit. Though weirdly that's not doing anything and that's because the floor is underneath our mouse group. So let's undo that and then grab him and drag it down just a little bit. And then we can fix his tail up here. Let's just point this a little more upwards and kind of give it a nicer curve. We could actually scale up the tail if we take one of these joints at the beginning here and just scale it up. So now he's got a bit more of an interesting looking tail. And now let's rotate this even more upwards and now we can see the tail at the back. And we could even scale up this joint a little bit too. And keep going down the line here. I think I'm digging that. All right, so next let's go and find a fork for him. Maybe I'll look through the content browser and see if there's anything available. All right, so if I go to window, content browser, I can just type in fork. And we get two kinds of forks already. And this one seems a bit more charming to me, even though it's technically a carving fork, I think that it works as a cheese fork. Just to prove it to myself, cheese fork. There we go, see there's a little two prong guy, that's close enough, I think it works. 
So I'll just drop this in here, double click. And it's gigantic, of course. Let's rotate it upwards and rotate it 90 degrees this way. Bring it a little forward. Something maybe like that, maybe a bit bigger. So this material is a bit distracting, so I'm just gonna go in here and delete these guys. There we go. So now he's actually got something to grab onto. But you know, after looking at it for a second, I'm feeling like there's something cool about this really long and skinny fork that gives the cheese a bit more distance from him. Here the cheese would kind of just be obscuring his face a bit, and I don't think this is long enough. We can make it a lot bigger, and that might work. But I'm feeling this long and skinny thing, so I'm going to go look on Turbo Squid and see if we can't find anything better. Okay, so I found nothing good on Turbo Squid, so I've decided I'm just going to modify this fork myself. So let's turn off this symmetry here. And let's just turn off this piece entirely and focus first on this part. I'm going to turn off the subdivision surface, and I'm just going to take all of this here and go into one of my orthogonal views. I'm going to make sure I've got only select visible elements off, and I'm just going to grab all of this and scale it in to make a skinnier handle. Let's make sure that's not messing up any of the geometry up here. Now, if you get this issue where you've got viewport clipping, you can hit Control D, and here let's change our view clipping to tiny so that we can see a little bit closer. And actually, if I scale down from here, this scales a lot more naturally. Before, I was creating a couple of really gross triangles and errors in the geometry back here, so I think this is a better move. All right, so next we can just take all of these polys here and make sure, again, only select visible elements is off. So let's grab all this stuff here, and let's make sure we're getting the very tops of these two. And let's grab this one as well and just extend this upwards. And we could go even further. So now we've got this very long polygon here, and to make sure that we don't get any stretching, what I can do is go UB, which is ring select, grab all of these edges here, and I'm gonna use my shortcut for connect, which is, I've set it up to be under customize commands. It's shift alt D, connect points edges. So I'll just do this a few times. And there we go, that's a bit more evenly subdivided, and that should just prevent any unwanted stretching. Okay, now let's turn on our subdivision surface and I'll bring my little handle back and this guy can also just get scaled in. Uh, if I just select everything, I can just squeeze it on in and that should be fine. And the last thing I wanna do is take this and just kinda of squish it down a little bit. Okay, actually, I've decided to make one more change with this fork and it delves a little bit more into modeling, so if you're not interested in that, then just skip this section. But I'd really like to make this fork have a bit more curvature like this one. I don't really like how geometric this is looking. It doesn't look especially realistic to me with all these extremely sharp corners. And I've only just been getting into modeling. I am by no means even remotely good at it, but there are maybe a few small tricks you can pick up here. So I'm gonna deactivate this subdivision surface and I'll fly in here. And the first thing I wanna do is switch to edge mode. And a lot of these extra edges can be just dissolved to give more curvature. So here, for instance, I can remove this and this, I can just double click to select these, and I'll hit MN, which is my shortcut for dissolve, to get rid of those. And then here, I'll double click this and this, and hit MN again. And now if I turn back on our subdivision surface, you can see that's created a lot more curvature. Now we can up this to a count of three, and already we've got more of a nice curve right there. Now what can we do about these sides here? First off, let's hit NF to switch to hidden line mode, which is a lot easier to see. I can select these edges here and dissolve them so that we've got quads. And now I can take these edges right here and double click and hit MO, which is my edge slide tool. And I'll just slide these upwards a bit, something like that. And now you can see we've got a lot more curvature here. I'll do the same thing on the other side. Again. Let's turn off the subdivision surface. Let's grab these two edges and hit MN to dissolve. Then grab this edge, double click, and shift double click. Hit MO to edge slide, and then just click and drag until it's approximately the same. You can see we built in a lot more curvature into this already. Now I wanna do the same thing at the top of the fork here, 
and just bring this edge down and actually again let's use edge slide because you can see if we just scoot it down it creates some deformations whereas if we hit mo and edge slide it'll slide cleanly down here and you can also see there's a little issue with the geometry here so if we go back you can see this is kind of caving in for whatever reason so we can just select these points and kind of bring them forward I could probably select all these points here hit T to scale hold down shift until we're at zero and now that's flattened out so I'll do the same thing over here select all these points right here hit T hold down shift and scale to zero now again take that edge MO slide this down and slide this down and now NA to go back and this is a little bit smoother at the top to create even more curvature here on this side what we can do is we could grab this edge and also this edge and we could just scale these in a little bit just like that and now it's a little bit more curved and similarly on this side here to make this a little less sharp what I could do is double click this edge here and hit MO and just edge slide this now we start to get an issue really quickly which is that this edge overlaps the previous one if we even slide it a little bit but instead of fixed distance we can set this to proportional so now when we slide it inwards say to about here you can see that at the top we're not causing overlap on the edges so let's just do the same thing with this other edge let's come back down here slide it in maybe to there and then at the top we're not overlapping so that just softens that a little bit it's still pretty sharp but not too sharp I'm gonna do the same thing with the front of this so I'll double click this edge and slide this a little bit forward and same thing with this one slide this out and same thing here just scooch this guy and if I turn the subdivision surface back on you can see that's softened everything out a little bit now the last thing I want to take care of is I don't love this pinching here and we've got some pretty terrible triangles and other grossness going on down here so here I'm just going to try welding these points upwards if I hit MQ I can bring up my weld tool and if I hold down control I can weld these points together and I'll do the same thing the other side doesn't have the same issue though there is this triangle here so we could just weld this upwards and then just have one big quad here let's try welding this in okay and this with this here let's just dissolve out these two edges so that cleans up a little bit and I'm gonna try taking out this loop here and this loop here just dissolve those and so we're getting closer to a clean result here we took out the edge in the middle but that doesn't bother me because again I want it to have a little bit more curvature and so now our main last problem is right here uh, we can just weld this in to get rid of these end gons let's also weld some of these together here there we go it's looking at least consistent and finally let's slide these four edges over just a little bit and we're left with four triangles here but it's definitely not the end of the world because when we turn on the subdivision surface you can see a lot of this has smoothed out and from a distance where we're gonna be everything looks pretty nice alright last little thing let's squish this in just a little bit see subconsciously this must be what I was trying to go for more of a fondue fork like one of these guys or something like this perfect for stabbing your different forms of melty cheese there okay let's finish up posing this guy so I'll bring this carving fork back into place and maybe tip it back so that he can kind of hold it more like a flagpole 
something like that though maybe not so much we want it somewhat close to his body and let's come back to our layer panel and lock this again and make sure we go to filter and turn back on our joints and let's just start up here at the clavicle and begin rotating these into place pretty self-explanatory stuff here and maybe we could relax the hand a little bit we have to watch out for intersections Maybe I'll bend this thumb a little bit towards his fingers just to make it feel a bit more relaxed. So I'm kind of liking that. Let's pose the second arm here. Okay, we can't go too far with this clavicle because it starts to intersect a lot. Though that might not be true once the subdivision surface is on. That definitely helps things a lot. Though we're getting some pretty intense wrinkles here. So let's just bend this a bit. We might have to push it a bit further in order to get the arm over there. There we go, that's getting closer. And that's about as far as his arm can comfortably extend. So maybe we tip the fork in the direction of the hand. This is looking a bit too scrunched to me, so I'll release some tension by pulling this clavicle a little bit back and then pulling this upper arm forward. Okay, now it's actually starting to feel like it's resting on his chest a little bit, which is good. And here maybe we can just rest this thumb on top of this handle, almost like it's guiding it or holding it in place. All right, that's looking pretty solid to me. Let's turn on the subdivision surface here. I think that should work pretty well. All right, so I actually had to go back and recover the version of the mouse with these eye bones and then repose it to match what we'd done before because as I moved the neck, I discovered something really weird happening. So I had actually, when I clicked these, deleted both bones for the eye. So let me show you what happens if we do that again. And then when we try to move the neck, you can see the eyes are doing something pretty crazy. So I wasn't wrong that these can be deleted, but I was selecting instead of the endpoint, this joint here, and this was selecting the child as well. So instead, let's just select these two endpoints and delete these. And now if we try moving the neck, we'll still be in good shape. Again, this might be a weird technical issue with just my rig, but it might actually help some of you with the rigs you're working with too. Okay, next I'd like to give this pose a bit more of a dynamic look, like he's actually stepping forward, and I'm gonna do that with the spine here. So if we tilt this forward, you'll notice that our fork isn't coming with. 
So the easiest solution to that is just parenting the fork to the spine. So let's grab this carving fork here and drop it under the base spine joint here. And now if we select anywhere on this spine, the fork should follow. Though not if we select this upper spine, so maybe actually let's move it down further. Now this way, no matter which joint of the spine we select, the fork will come with. So I'd like to bend him a little bit forward, but then take the next joint up in the chain and bend it a little bit like this. So almost like he's kind of puffing his chest out. I kind of like this S shape to his spine a little bit better. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to our layers and unlock our geometry here. And the other thing I'd like to point out here is that there's this really cool pose morph tag setup. So we can control various things like his blink or his smile. So just like the mouse in our reference, let's give him more of a smile. And then here, I think we can kind of simulate his eyes being a bit happier if we close up the bottom lids a bit and maybe even the top lids a touch. And I also think we could rotate his head joint. Now see, because it's unlocked, it's harder to get to the joint, but you can also get to it by double clicking. So maybe something like that is a little bit cuter. Okay, and finally, let's try to pose his ears and also grow his ears a bit bigger to match our reference. So first off, we can just take these joints here. I'm gonna lock our layer again. And let's just take a joint like this and rotate it to the side. You can see that kind of folds in on itself. So in this case, we can actually break the rules a bit and kind of move it as well to kind of relax this feature a bit more. Same thing goes with the joint on this side. Let's rotate it out a bit, and then let's move it as well. Now to scale his ears up, I'm gonna go back to the layers and unlock. And now if we click here on the mouse and go to polygon mode, what I can do is I can select a loop around the ears. So I'll hit UL, and if I go back here, there's a loop that works pretty well right here. And then I can use UF to fill and hold down shift to select that whole region of the ear. Now I can hit T to scale, but you'll notice that this is just gonna create a ton of distortion in the polygons and isn't gonna work very well. But what I can do is go over here to soft selection and enable this. And now when we scale, it's going to have a lot more feathering, but we've got a bit too much of the ear selected. So what I can do is go to UK, which is gonna shrink the selection, UK again, and that's gonna work a bit better. The other thing I wanna point out is that our modeling axis, I've already done this, but usually it's at zero, zero, zero. And in this case, that would be scaling from the center. So that's not what we want. So if we go back and scoot this over 100% on X and then scoot it over a bit on the Z axis as well. And maybe also on the Y. we'll get a much better pivot point to scale from. So we can kind of scale it like that and also scoot these points back a bit, okay? And now when I click off of this, you'll notice that it pops back to its original position and we've lost the work that we just created. And I thought this was going to be another reason why I had to bake down the mesh until I realized that I could actually utilize this pose morph tag. And instead of being on this animate mode, if I go to edit and I say add pose, I can scroll down and call this ear embiggen and then do that same kind of operation here let's scale this back up and maybe not until the polygons are overlapping let's do until just before that and then scoot this back and scale it up a bit more and scoot it back even more and keep in mind that the subdivision surface is going to be on as well so that's going to dramatically change the look though we can see that we haven't quite nailed it so Let's undo and try to get a better selection going. I'll shrink the selection one more time, make sure only select visible is on, and add a couple polygons here. The issue is that we don't have any of these polygons selected. So let's try to get all these guys. So something like that might work a bit better at seeming to stretch a bit more naturally. And then again, let's move these backwards a little bit to kind of relax this area. And now let's turn our subdivision surface back on. That's looking a bit more natural. 
And now what you should be able to see is that if we go to animate and scroll down, we'll have this ear and begin slider. And that'll actually allow us to animate this if we wanted to. So it's created a morph between those two states of these points, one where the points exist out here and another where those same points exist here. And that's all any of these pose morphs are doing. The ones for these eyebrows and eyelids and whatnot are literally just different positions that the character modeler set these points to in order to create these different expressions. So let's come back here to edit and let's do the same thing to the other ear, UL to loop select. Let's grab this loop, UF to fill, T to scale, UK to shrink the selection a bit. And then let's scale this up and try to match the size of the other ear and maybe scoot it back a little bit. I think the position of these ears can be tweaked a little bit and we've also got this kind of weird bump going on. So let's try to fix that. Let's try deselecting some of these polys. Let's select some of these polygons in the back here. And the other thing I forgot to mention with soft selection is that you actually have to set a tolerance. So by default, this has a much higher tolerance and it will probably all look yellow at first. But if I set this back to something like 0.1 in my case, you'll see that we're getting a much nicer fall off. Now maybe we could go a bit higher to 0.2 or even let's see what happens when we go to one. And you can see now it's really getting a gradual fall off, but that would also be affecting too much of the head. So I'm gonna go back to something like 0.1. And I think this overlap here is caused by maybe not the best weighting, but if I just bend this ear a little bit back or actually more towards camera, you see that that resolves. And let's also tilt it a little bit downwards. And let's see what happens once the subdivision surface is on. And actually, another way to fix this overlapping issue might just be to grab some of these polygons here. Let's just select these guys that are sticking out here. I think I went a little too far. Let's deselect these and kind of pull them this way. And here you can see which ones we've actually selected. We're just kind of doing this operation here. And that fixes this issue with the ear. And finally, when we go back to our animate mode in our pose morph tag, all of those adjustments will come back with a face. Now for any of you wanting to bake this down and not deal with the rig anymore, to do that you might run into some issues. For instance when I hit C on the subdivision surface, this is what happens. So I have no idea what causes this but that's disgusting, let's undo. The first thing to do is just delete the pose morph tag. And now all this kind of gets locked in. And then we can go ahead and delete the poses. And now when we hit C, everything's fine. And now this is all baked down to a high poly mesh. But in my case, because I just discovered this, I actually want to keep this live. And if I ever wanted to go back and animate this scene or something like that, I would be able to. All right, let's go ahead and add that hair. So again, we need our connect object. So let's just jump over here and add a connect while holding down alt. And remember, let's turn off weld. And the strange thing here is that we're getting this duplicate of the mouse because the poses are in here. But if we delete the poses, then we lose everything we've done with the pose morph tag. So let's undo that. And also hiding them won't help because the connect object is just seeing everything below it. But what we can do is we can just drag the poses out of the hierarchy and then hide them. Okay, and now let's go to simulate, hair objects, add hair. Again, let's take our guides down to a length of like 0.1. And let's go to the polygon area and regrow and we don't need this many guides. Let's just take it down to 5,000. And then under our hairs, let's crank this up to 500,000. And there we go, we can see it's working, but this isn't gonna be good for the viewport, so let's take it back to 50,000. And this allows us to navigate a lot more freely and see what's going on with hairs. Cool, so if you look back here at one of my previous renders, it should become clear that we're gonna to have to select certain areas like the hands and the inside of the ears where we don't see any hair at all. And also we're going to have to divide the model up into areas that just have this darker hair and then areas that have the beefer. So basically it's divided into his body and then another selection tag to divide it into his head, ears, and arms. Okay, at this point I think we can lose this plane back here because we don't need to reference it for anything else. Next let's turn off the connect and subdivision surface and the hair and let's just focus on creating selection tags for the different regions we've got to block off. Obviously the eyes are popping through here, but that won't affect anything. We can just turn those off for now. Okay, first I'm gonna create the selection for his head and arms, where we're just gonna have that dark brown fur. 
So I'll hit UL to select a loop here. And this isn't working, so let's come here. This is about the furthest loop we can select. And then I can just paint in some additional polygons. I think that works. And then UF to fill. And again, UL, UF. And then I'll just grab these additional guys here. And same thing with the neck and head. Let's grab this loop. Let's actually grab this loop here so that these are connected. UF. Okay, now we'll have to deselect some loops here. So let's go UL and grab just around the nose. And I'm deselecting that loop. Then I'll hit UF. We don't want the hair on the nose, obviously. And then let's grab the inside of the ears. So UL again. UF. Same thing. And finally, we don't want hair on the inside of the eye sockets. So let's go UL. Let's grab this one. And then UF again. And grab the same loop on the other side. And finally, to prevent hair from being on the inside of the mouth, let's take this loop here. Yep, that worked. And then UF. And deselect all that. All right, and I've got a button for set selection, so I'll just use that. But you could always do Shift C and then just type in set selection and use that. Now, to more easily get the rest of the body, we can use UI to invert the selection and then UF to deselect these areas that we don't want. And similarly with the feet and tail, we've got to select some loops here. So UL again, let's just select a few loops really quick. And UF. And there we go. Now we want to make sure we don't have the same selection tag highlighted or it'll get overwritten. So let's first deselect the tag and then reselect the mouse and hit set selection again. And we'll name this selection body and this one will be face and arms. Let's turn back on our connect and subdivision surface. And then let's bring back the hair. This one we can call face and arms. And under the guides, let's link it to the face and arms tag. And it looks like our detail was down at 25% somehow, so let's bring that back to 100. But you can see here that we've got this issue again where it's not conforming to the shape of the subdivision surface because we've got a selection tag. All right, so the last idea I had was to use this thing called the correction deformer, which actually gives you access to the points and polygons of a procedural or parametric object. So if we drop this just underneath the connect object here, it's going to take a minute to update. Now it's almost as if we baked down the subdivision surface, but we haven't. We can still access the rig and still move things around. But weirdly, these polygon selections don't transfer over. So you can see something really weird happens. It doesn't understand these old polygon selections. So just for a quick demo, let's select a loop. We're not going to go into as much detail as before. Let's just grab a loop here and hit UF to just fill the whole head for now. And then we'll set selection on this correction deformer. Now, I don't think it makes a difference whether the connect object is on or off at this point. The correction deformer basically reads the points and polygons of the objects that it's a child of, but it also reads the points from other neighbors in the same hierarchy. For instance, say we created a sphere and we dropped in the correction deformer here and we group both of these into a null. Now we can access these polygons, same thing as if the correction deformer is underneath it. But if it's not grouped into a null, it looks like it works, but something weird is happening where we're just seeing this cage. It's not actually pulling the geometry. So the second we group these, then it actually works. Okay, so now back to our mouse dude. Let's click on our face and arms hair here and drag in the selection for the correction deformer. And then instead of root custom, let's change it back to polygon area and regrow. And let's jump these hairs. This keeps happening. 
I don't know why it keeps defaulting back to this, but let's choose roots, auto, and there we go, we've got our hairs back. And now we've avoided that issue with the ears, and we can still, if we're doing animation, grab one of these joints here and rotate it, and all of those hairs will follow with. So this is great. But the issue I've been running into is that the second I untick the subdivision surface, for instance, say I wanted to do that to be able to work on the low poly model and pose the character and move things around much more quickly, which is the standard workflow you do with character animation, and then turn back on your subdivision surface once you're done and wait a million years for it to update because the correction deformer is figuring things out. Now this weirdness has happened, and that's because if we look at the selection tag for the correction deformer, it's completely changed. So this really isn't a viable workflow for character animation. So if any of you have an idea of how to fix this, I'm all ears. Uh, I don't do a ton of character animation or character work. So if you've got a better workflow, hit me up in the comments and I'll include it in the next tutorial. Okay, so I actually went and posted this on the MoGraph.com Slack because I was getting so mad that this wasn't working. And to the rescue came my buddy Billy Chicken, who came up with this really simple and awesome solution. So let me show you this real quick. So you know how there's this skin deformer that's basically responsible for taking all of the adjustments you make to the rig and transferring it to the geometry of the character through weighting and all that. And normally if you turn on your subdivision surface and break this down, it's going to remove that skin deformer and now you can't really make any adjustments to the rig anymore. Well, instead, you could just simply remove the skin deformer, bake it down, and then put it back. Now, it's lost the list of objects to include because that object has changed, but if you just drag in the same object, look, everything pops back to normal. So that's pretty freaking awesome. And amazingly, too, all of our selection tags from before have been translated to this higher subdivision version of the character. So now when we turn on our hair, we just need to set it to the new polygon selection here and then do the same polygon area regrow deal. And look, it's magically working. Now when I go back and take my spine, for instance, here and start rocking, all the hairs are updating. So this is pretty amazing and everything still updates extremely quickly even though it's a somewhat higher poly model. So this opens up a lot of possibilities I feel for character animation with hair. Now I recorded this last after I'd already finished the rest of the tutorial so when we pop back I'm going to basically bake down the whole rig anyway but hopefully this will help anybody wanting to do animation with hair in Cinema 4D. Okay so I'm going to go ahead and finally bake this down so I'm just going to hit C but remember, we get this weirdness unless we delete our pose morph tag first. And now I'm going to hit C. C for commit. And I'll delete my connect object and all that stuff. And now in our face and arms here, we can drag in our face and arms polygon selection. And then again, this is jump back to custom. So let's go back to polygon area, regrow. There we go. And back to hairs, I'm going to go back to auto. Awesome, and now let's duplicate our face and arms and name this body. And go back to our guides and relink to our other polygon selection, which is our body. And then again, let's regrow. So that's looking great, and now we'll be able to have two separate materials, one that handles the bee fur on the body and the other that handles the fur on the face and arms. It looks like somehow we lost the hands on this selection tag, so I'll turn these off real quick, and this is a simple fix. I'll just loop select and grab a couple of these loops here. And this time I'll make sure to have this selection tag selected so that when I click here, it overwrites. Now turning these back on, it's automatically updated, which is great, and we should be good to go. All right, let's turn these eyes on here and we can label these. This one is the right eye. This one's the tongue. And this one is the left eye. Let's put this up here. And let's clean this up a little bit more. We don't need the rig anymore, but if we were to just delete it, things would go a little bit haywire. So first off, let's take the carving fork out of here. And also several of these pieces of geometry still have skin, so let's just hit C to make these editable. And same thing with the teeth, though the teeth also have pose morph tags, so let's get rid of those first. 
and then make all these editable. And now we can comfortably delete the rig. And we don't need these poses. And we also don't need this grooming layer. All right, so we're all baked down and finally ready to move into Octane. Let's go back to this editor and change these hairlines to none because this will speed up our viewport performance. And from now on, we're just gonna be looking at these hairs inside Octane directly. All right, I'm gonna go to my Octane layout But I'm actually going to adjust this because I'm going to be doing more of an Instagram type render here. So let's get our live viewer over on this side and then I'll dock the settings over here too. Cool. And I'll fire this off. And right off the bat, you can see we've got something truly beautiful going on. So let's get this fixed up. Okay. I'm going to kill the render because it's so, so slow. And you can see I just got a render failure because these hairs are extremely thick to start out with at least with the scale that I'm working in. So when this happens, that means you got to save and quit and go back in. All right, so here we are again. And the main thing I want to adjust is this hair material here. So under the thickness, let's set instead of the root to one centimeter, so let's set it to 0.1 and the tip to 0 0.001. I'm not sure if these are the right numbers, but let's just start out with this. So obviously that's a lot better to start. But if we zoom in here, it's still pretty horribly ugly. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, 0.1 is still way too thick. So let's start with, let's try 0.006 or something like that. And there we go. That's getting closer to the thickness I want my hairs. And it's just going to take a lot more of these really, really small hairs to cover the whole body. But that's what's going to give it that nice soft look. All right, for now, we're just doing this testing. So let's just drop in a daylight and I'll rotate it around so that we can see what's going on a bit better. Ultimately, this is going to be an indoor scene, but just so that we can kind of get a sense of what's going on, let's use this lighting. And I'll drop kind of a gray diffuse texture down on the floor here. There we go. All right, let's also drop in a basic glossy material here and put it on these hair objects. So this is actually gonna control how the hair is shaded. And these default C4D materials are gonna control the length of the hair, the clumping, the frizziness, all that kind of stuff. So these don't really control the color or anything like that, but we can add octane materials on top to control the actual texture of the hair. So let's just jump in here. Let's say we want a brown dark brown color and let's give it a bit more roughness and the index is 1.3 I think in the past I bumped it up to maybe 1.4 1.5 but that's just if you want shinier or less shiny hair I'm also going to switch to path tracing because that's usually how I work and I'm going to change my max samples to 1000 for the time being and change my GI clamp down to one so that's just let a bit more light in and the hairs already look a little bit softer. Now we just have to dial in this Cinema 4D materials settings. So let's just turn off the body hair right now because things can start to get really slow as we add a bunch more hairs. So it's good if we can just limit the hair to a smaller section for the time being. Now let's double click and jump in to this material. If we go to basic, you'll see the main three things on at first are color, specular, and thickness. Color and specular don't matter because those are being controlled by Octane's material here. But thickness really does matter, and that's where we adjusted the root and tip. Now we could include a little bit of variation if we want. If we boost this to something higher, I think we'll see a difference. Now you can see some hairs are thicker than others. This is kind of killing the look of the softness though, so let's for now not worry about variation here. We'll add lots of other variation in the other tabs. So let's turn on scale. And just so we can see what this is doing, let's go compare store render buffer. Actually, let's jump in even closer and maybe we'll use a longer lens. So I've just held down to and right click to zoom the focal length in rather than using the wide lens we were on. So let's go compare store render buffer and untick scale. So by default, you can see that it's scaling up certain hairs more than others. I'll exaggerate that real quick by just changing the scale amount to say 500. 
and now you can see it's just scaling up all the hairs but the main thing is the variation so if we change this variation to 100 percent for instance we get some hairs that are really short and others that are really long so let's just reset these i think in this case the default's fine though maybe we want to up the variation a bit all right we're going to skip over kink for now let's store the render buffer again and actually at this point i'm going to up the number of hairs to close to what we're going to use as our final amount the trade-off though is that this is going to get really slow but i like to see things in context and i like to see how these settings are affecting our character when we look at the final amount of hairs because it's pretty hard to see with all this patchy grossness going on so i know from experience that the amount of hairs that i want on the face are going to be close to a million and now you can really see where this is going. Now one other issue is obviously the white skin, and once we get that nice subsurface scattering skin dialed in, we won't be seeing these white patches through there. We'll see much more of a natural look through the hair. Okay, let's keep tweaking this material here. I'll just compare store render buffer again, and let's turn on length. Okay, so that's changing something, but it's really hard to tell. Let's move on to something that's gonna make a lot more difference, which is this bend. Okay, and so that's just going to bend each of the hairs in a random direction a little bit. We could probably up this amount. Let's try 30% with 30% variation. All right, so that's starting to look a lot softer and more random, so that's nice. Let's try this Titan setting. Okay, so Titan has really pulled all these hairs inward and made him look like a Brillo pad, so I'm not really into that. Maybe we could use it in a very small amount, like 1%. All right, so that's just kind of pulled them down slightly, and I think I'm okay with that change. It's just adding a bit more variation. All right, so the main one that is gonna make a big difference is clump. Let's turn this on. All right, so right off the bat, that's definitely looking like too much, so we're gonna have to dial that down. Now, one interesting value down here, if we twirl open clumping, is this limit. And this is kind of like the scale of the clumps. So if we bring this down to 50, I think it'll look a little bit nicer. There we go. So that looks a lot more natural to me, and I don't think we actually need to reduce the amount of clump anymore. I think it's looking pretty good. Let's take a look at wave. So this one's interesting. It might be a little hard to see, so I'm going to boost the amount, but it creates all these little rings, or I guess waves, of kind of matted versus unmatted fur, I guess. And I'm going to go back so that we have something to compare to. Okay, and I'll store that. It's almost like that effect when the lawn is mowed. These are my Google results for fancy lawn mode. Now under the wave settings, we can up the scale. Okay, so that just created this crazy effect that I don't understand at all. So I'm just gonna run away and not use wave. All right, let's try introducing a bit of frizz. Okay, so this definitely adds a lot more variation, but I think it's way too much. So I'm gonna take this down to just like 5%. That's subtle, but it's adding something. In general, I'm trying to not add anything that makes him look less soft and cuddly. That's my goal, is ultra soft and ultra cuddly. Let's see where we get with kink, though I feel like this one's going to be pretty similar to frizz in how it operates. And in general, kink kind of breaks the hair and makes more of a spiky angle. See, with this, I think we're getting back to that rough look, so let's not use it. Let's try boosting the amount of scale and the variation. Okay, so that's puffed him out a lot more and made him look real fuzzy, but it might be a bit too much, so let's take this variation up to 100% and see if it dials it back a bit. Okay, so of course taking this to 100% variation means it's actually even longer and even shorter, so let's go back to 100 on this value. I think that amount of poofing is kind of nice. Let's back up and see what this looks like a bit further out. Yeah, I think that'll work pretty nicely once we get the skin shaders dialed in. Maybe we could even take up the amount of clump because from back here, we're not really reading it as much. And let's also take the variation up to 20%. Let's split the difference and go to 15. And I'll reset the variation as well. Because keep in mind, this is always plus or minus 10%. So being at 20% boosted us from a range of 35% to 5%. There we go, that's looking a bit more natural and I can still feel the clumps. Let's see what curl does. This is the very last one we haven't really tried. And again, that's just way too much, but let's see if 10% is good. That's maybe making them look a bit more shaggy, but I don't really like all these weird white patches that are showing up, so I'm gonna lose this. Though honestly, for this kind of thing, it's pretty hard to say how this is gonna look in these lighting conditions. So I'm gonna create some lights that more accurately reflect how this is gonna look in the end. So I'll turn off the daylight, I'll drop in a texture environment and just set the texture to black and then I'll start dropping in some area lights. OK, 
Okay, so this is huge. Let's scale this way down. We're working a really small scale right now. Push this one back. And I'll set this to zero opacity so we don't see it in the renderer. And maybe this one can be warmer. So this is going to be our backlight. And I'll duplicate another one by control dragging and kind of make this more of a side light. And then I'll drag out a third one here that's going to be more of a fill. And I can move this a little bit more in front and tone it way down and maybe make it a bit cooler. And let's label these. This will be side, back, front, fill. And then what we can do is we can select all three of these and set them to light pass three or any light pass we want really. And then with the floor, we can right click and add an octane object tag and go to our object layer and change this use light pass to enable and take off three. So now those lights are not affecting the floor. So this is light linking, which is new in Octane 4. And let's drag this light a little bit further back. So it's really only hitting half of the face. So we're getting this nice other half of the face more in shadow. And then with the backlight, we can boost that even more. And let's make it smaller. And it's kind of hard to see what its contribution is, so let's take off the side and front. And you can see it's working, but it's only getting a very slight rim. So let's kind of move it around until we get something a bit better. Maybe bring it a little bit forward. There we go. That's doing more what I expect. So I just brought it closer. And we could even kind of rotate it over. Let's turn these other lights back on. The side light's probably too intense. But this is all really hard to figure out until we get the skin shaders working. So for now, let's turn off the face and arm here. And let's texture this guy. So I'm going to go to materials, remove unused materials. So we're only using octane materials. And actually, these guys are physical materials. So I'll go materials, convert materials, and materials, remove unused materials. So now we're all octane. And for the eyes, we can just create a glossy material that's perfectly shiny and black. So I'll drop that on there. And let's go diffuse and take it all the way down. And it doesn't need any roughness. And then let's just drop it on the other eye here. Oops, that's interesting. <laughs> let's try to get that eye right there. And for the body, this character came with a diffuse map and some other maps. So let's add those in. So let's just create a new diffuse material and drop that on the mouse here and open up our node editor and let's give ourselves a bit more space okay and let's take an image texture and drag it into the diffuse and I'll navigate to where my guy is here alright so here's the diffuse texture I'll open that up so you guys can see it beautiful all UV mapped Lots of models you buy in TurboSquid or CG Trader will already be UV mapped like this. So that's getting a lot closer. Let's see what other maps we've got. So let's duplicate this and just replace it. So we've got a normal map. Let's use that. Pull that into the normal slot. And let's kind of zoom in and see what that's actually doing. So if we compare store and then get rid of it. So that's adding just a bit more detail, so that's nice. And let's duplicate this again. And let's see, there's a specular map as well. No roughness map, but that's fine. So in order to get that working, we'll change this to a glossy texture. And drop this into the specular. And let's store this render buffer. And if we go back to a diffuse texture, there's honestly not that big of a difference. So I don't even know if I care about this map so much. 
Now, if we add the hair back in, this is what we've got. So you can see that's kind of nice, but this is feeling very plasticky and not very real. So I want to add this pink color through the subsurface scattering. And in order to do that, let's again, take off our hair so that we can work quickly. I'm gonna switch this to a specular material. So now we got a glassy mouse. And if we zoom in, I wanna add a scattering medium to our medium channel here. And I wanna to add two RGB spectrums to that so we can control the color of the absorption and the scattering. Okay, for now, let's just set these both to white. And let's boost the density even more until we get something that feels a little bit more like skin. And I think we're also gonna to need to up our roughness here So that's getting a lot closer. Now, we don't really have the diffuse map doing anything anymore, but we do have this transmission slot, and in specular materials, the transmission slot kind of acts like a diffuse map. So let's try plugging this directly into our transmission slot. So there we go, now we're inheriting the color pretty intensely. I think that it's a bit too much, so we can go and add in a color correction here, and just take down the saturation a little bit. If we wanted, we could also get the same effect without transmission by changing the absorption and scattering colors. So the absorption color is going to affect the overall color a lot more. So say we chose a bit more of a pinkish color like this. Let's just see which one of these skin colors we like better. So let's compare store that. The scattering color is a bit different. Let's just replace this with a white color on absorption. And say we patched in this as the scattering color instead. You can see it kind of gives you the inverse of this color, but say we used instead a green. There we go, that's getting a little bit closer. But the issue with putting a color into the scattering medium here is that you get multiple colors. We're getting kind of a greenish here and we're getting a pinkish here. Depending on the thickness and where the light is entering and exiting, we're getting different colors. You can see that if I boost the density, you can see where it's really thin, like the ears and the toes, we're getting that pink color, and other places we're getting this greenish. But that's not really what I want. I want something a bit more uniform. So I'm gonna put a white color back into the scattering medium. That would be this one here. And then I'm gonna put our pink color back into the absorption. Now that's way too intense. So this is with a somewhat higher density, but I think I like this look a bit better. It gets some nice subsurface scattering on these extremities, but not in the core of the mouse. Whereas before, I think there was just too much subsurface going on everywhere. So let's store this render buffer and see if we get a better look with this diffuse map in the transmission channel like we were doing before. And then again, let's take this guy. Let's just pull this one out and put a white color in there for now. So this is with a transmission channel, and this is without. And actually, I'm kind of liking the transmission channel. It's adding a bit more grunge, because in this case, we're actually using this color map to affect the transmission channel. So we're getting a lot of variation in there. If we dolly in here, you should be able to see all this variation on his belly. So I think I'll go with that, and then I'll turn the hair back on. And with the body hair, I wanna add just as many hairs as the face and arms. So let's take this up to a million. And then let's turn these both back on. All right, so we're getting somewhere, but the lighting definitely needs a lot of work. I hate how it's kind of blowing out these ears up here, but you can see the subsurface scattering start to work, and we're getting some interesting variation here where we're seeing the hairs on the back side of the ear through the ear. I feel like the hair is a little bit too greenish color. I'd like to make it a little bit more dark brown, and I think the clumping is a bit too spiky, so I'm gonna fix a few of those things, and maybe we can lengthen out the body hair. So let's just do that first. Let's take our body hair guides and take the length to 0.1. Let's try 0.15. Cool, I like how much that poofed him up. We've got a few of these hairs intersecting here on the fork, but that's okay. I think we can brush these out of the way at some point or just cut them. 